So this is the life of Jesus in chronological order. And you've got worksheets to be able to kind of put it all, all the information that we're giving. And hopefully by the end of, uh, by the end of this class you'll have a file and in that file you'll have the life of Jesus, all the events, chronological order with all the biblical references and hopefully a little bit of a commentary on some of the things that are going on. So last week we started with the first major section of Jesus' life, the period from just before His birth to a time when He was 12 years old in the, in the various periods of His life. That first period is from, again, before His birth to when He's about 12. There's a lot of speculation about the period um, after this until His 30th day or His 30th year, but the Bible simply states that he returned to be with his parents. Lots of literature, lots of speculation as to what happened during those approximately 18 years. But you have to remember, since the Bible states that his you know, turning water into wine was which miracle? His first. I mean, the Bible specifically states that it was his first miracle and then subsequent visits to teach at his hometown synagogue were met with surprise, we can conclude a few things about that early period. And again, if you want to look at material that's outside the Bible, you can come up with all kinds of wild theories, but if you're just going to stick with what the gospel writers have given to us. So here are some of the conclusions. First, he did not perform miracles or use His divine powers during this period. How do we know that? Well, the Bible says His first miracle was at Cana. Well, first means there weren't any before that. So all the extra biblical stories of miraculous powers and stuff like that are just that. They're just extra biblical, but they're not the official record. Secondly, He did not teach, He did not proclaim His person or mission before this time, but simply attended and participated in worship, just like his fellow Jews, because the Bible says at one point, as was his custom, he went to the synagogue, as was his custom. So his custom from an early age, like all good Jews, was to go to the, to the synagogue and participate in the synagogue. And what did they do at the synagogue? Well, they prayed, they, they read the, the law, the scriptures, uh, they sang. Uh, the rabbi would do a teaching, an exhortation, you know, pretty much the same, almost the same as what we do. And so he participated in that. And we also know from the Bible record that he moved out or he left his family's home and headed for Jerusalem at the age of 30. It also says in another place, we'll talk about that, he actually lived in Capernaum. I mean, his, not his growing up city, but the place where he lived as an adult. I mean, he wasn't a wanderer. He didn't live in a cave. You know? He lived in Capernaum. So his obscure life came to an end when his ministry to the Jews began at the River Jordan with his cousin John the Baptist. And so now we leave that first period and we go to the next period, the beginning of his public ministry. There are seven events in this section on the beginning of Jesus' public ministry which follow the first 15 events, because you see where, see, we start at number 16. We've already covered 15 events, so we start at number 16. Anybody who doesn't have notes from the previous things, I can give them to you, and uh, Hal has recorded the last couple of lessons, you can get the DVD. So the 16th event in Jesus' life is, the, is what's going on around Him. The preaching of John the Baptist, Matthew, Matthew 3, Mark 1, Luke 3, John 1. So all the gospel writers talk about John the Baptist. In its discussion of the future Messiah, the Old Testament prophets described a person who would appear on the scene as a forerunner to introduce or to prepare the way for the Messiah. Isaiah, for example, chapter 40, verse 3. Malachi, chapter 3, verse 1. These Old Testament prophets spoke of the forerunner, the one who would come before Jesus. So with his appearance and preaching, John fulfilled this prophecy. And John's message was twofold. 
First, repent of sins and be baptized in order to symbolize the cleansing of their souls, forgiveness of their sins. And then the second piece, if you wish, of his preaching was that his successor would come to baptize these people, not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. All right, exactly. I want to remind you something of something here, <clears throat> and that is every time this, this notion of of a baptism with the Holy Spirit occurs, that either John or Jesus or someone else mentions it. It's never the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You will not find that phrase in the New Testament. You can go through it from beginning to end with a tooth comb, you will not find the term baptism of the Holy Spirit, because baptism of the Holy Spirit would signify that the Holy Spirit is the one doing the, bapti the baptizing. The term is always baptism with the Holy Spirit. You're receiving the Holy Spirit in an act of baptism. It's always that term. And I ask you, the baptism that belongs to the Holy Spirit is what? Little digression here, but I think it's worth noting. Which baptism belongs to the Holy Spirit? Wait, just I'll pause you just We'll let somebody outside the family try to get one here. Because <laughs> I feed them all the answers in case it'll be quiet. Which baptism belongs to the Holy Spirit? Come on. And why does that baptism belong to the Holy Spirit? Okay, that's the baptism with the Holy Spirit. But the baptism that belongs to the Holy Spirit is which one? Well, which one does the Spirit command? The really? Spirit, the separate life. No? Come on, this is, it's too easy. That's why you're not getting it. Yeah, okay, William. The baptism with water. The baptism with water. By what power does Peter say, <laughs> repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus? By what power does, he, does Peter say that? Through the, Holy through the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit speaking through Peter saying, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when you're having a discussion with uh, perhaps the people who are charismatic or Pentecostal, so on and so forth, and they bring up the issue of baptism of the Holy Spirit, try to show them that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is water baptism. It's the, it's the baptism that the Spirit commands. Baptism in the water in the name of Jesus. Baptism with the Holy Spirit, that's what Jesus gives you. That's what the apostles, that's what uh, uh, Billy is, is speaking of. Okay, a little digression there, but. So he promises the Spirit. His preaching was accepted by two groups and it was rejected by two groups. It was accepted by, um, the, um, uh, by sinners, you know, those who recognized their sinfulness. They saw a chance to be right with God. Even pagan soldiers were coming to John the Baptist to receive his baptism. And of course, those who were anxiously waiting the coming of the Messiah saw in John the one who was preparing the way. They recognized, oh, this is, this is the one that Isaiah spoke of. This is the one that uh, Malachi spoke of. Go ahead, uh, Billy. We're letting you call that John was the Messiah. He kept saying, I am not the Messiah. Right, right. Some thought he was the Messiah and he said, no, I'm not. But the people accepted the people who accepted his baptism understood that something was going on here from God. And then the people who rejected his baptism, those who felt confident in their Jewish heritage, rejected any call to change. They felt, hey, are you kidding me? We're sons of Abraham. My family goes all the way back. My father was a preacher. My grandfather was an elder. My great-great-grandfather once wrote a book. You know, what, do I, you know, what do I have to do? And those who love their sins, they also refuse to believe, especially in a Jewish Messiah, absolutely. So whatever the response, John got the nation's attention concerning the coming of the Lord. So 
Event number 16. Event number 17, the baptism of Jesus. Matthew 3, Mark 1, Luke 3, mention it. Now, baptism was a familiar religious rite among the Jews. This was nothing new for them. Priests would wash completely before becoming priests or before putting on their ceremonial robe from head to toe. You know, purification rites. New converts to Judaism needed to be cleansed with water in addition to being circumcised and then offering sacrifice at the temple. So if you were converted to Ju Judaism, a male, you had to be also washed from head to toe with water and circumcised and offer a sacrifice. So we know John baptized with water. We know that he did it by immersion because the Jews required a cleansing of the entire body in their purification rites. A Jew would not get it. You know, if you said, just sprinkle on the forehead and that's baptism, a Jew would not consider that a purification rite. Purification was head to toe. There was no, quote, symbolic water. It was water that covered you. Okay? And, and we know this. You know, aside from the word, what it means, the actual word, baptism in the Greek means to plunge or to immerse. So, Grammatically, contextually, historically, theologically, ever which way, baptism is always a complete immersion in water. Like circumcision, John's baptism was an expression of faith in response to God's offer. And there are some parallels with, you know, baptism isn't circumcision, but there are parallels. In circumcision, the offer was to be counted among God's people. In John's baptism, the offer was to have one's sins forgiven. Later, in Jesus' baptism, it was the triple offer. What was, what's the triple offer in Jesus' baptism? Number one, forgiveness of sins. Number two, uh, yeah, the Holy Spirit. What's number three? Mm, it, it's not what he mentions in Acts. Yeah. Well, yes, th those are true, but there's, there's a third thing that is specifically mentioned in the book of Acts. You're right, Entry, they, became, they were added to the church. So the triple thing that Jesus offered, and of course those other things are true, eternal life, but what was being articulated in the original preaching was forgiveness of sins, the reception of the Spirit, being added to the body of Christ. And I, I dare say, I, I'll tell you that for the Jews, the, the, the fulfillment of promise was not that their sins would be forgiven in baptism. The fulfillment of promise, the promise was that God would give them the Spirit to dwell within them all the time. Because in the Old Testament, the Spirit would fall on a prophet or would fall on a judge or would fall on a king for a time to enable them to do some great thing. And David would pray, please Lord, don't take your spirit away from me. The spirit was on Saul, the king, right? And he did great things, but then you know, he, he lost his way and, and, and the spirit was taken away. So the promise of the prophets that is, was that when the Messiah comes, the spirit that was only given a little bit to special people will be given to everybody old and young, men and women, slaves and free. That was the promise. We emphasize the forgiveness of sins, which is a biblical idea. But for the Jews in the first century, the emphasis, the wow, was actually the possession of the, the Spirit, always. That was the fulfillment of the, uh, of the promise. So Jesus signals the beginning of His ministry by accepting to be baptized by John. The big question here is why? So let's look at some of the reasons why. First, as a response of obedience, to fulfill, he says, all righteousness in Matthew 3.15, to respond to God's command with obedience. God commanded that all be baptized, all who were coming, all who were preparing for the kingdom, Jesus says, I'm fulfilling all righteousness. I'm doing everything that God asks to do. Secondly, to, and this is a tricky one, to identify with sin. Jesus had no sin Himself, but He took on the sin of others. So with this act, He acknowledges that sin exists 
and he, ex he identifies with sinners. He gets into their world. Thirdly, to separate himself from his old life. You know, baptism signifies a separation, a death. Romans chapter 6, verse 3, Paul says that we're baptized into his death. And the word death actually means, in the Hebrew, means to separate. That's what it means. So it doesn't mean to rot in a grave, it means to separate. Your body separates from your soul. And if you have a spiritual death, your soul separates from God. And so um, the baptism also signified a separation, a separation of the spirit and the flesh. But for Jesus at the age of 30, He is also separating Himself from His old life of submission and obscurity and taking on His new life of public ministry, lordship, and of course, finally, His death and resurrection. So He's separating Himself. Um, this new life, this inauguration of His public ministry is confirmed and witnessed by God in two ways. One, the heavens open, the Holy Spirit appears as a dove. This shows that Jesus received the gift of the Holy Spirit at this time as it came and rested upon Him. It was symbolic, but it was symbolic of something very powerful. And in His divine nature, He was equal and similar to the Father and to the Holy Spirit, but in His human nature, He receives the gift of the Holy Spirit in order to enable Him to carry on His ministry. He identifies with men in every aspect of their spiritual development. And secondly, God the Father speaks to confirm that Jesus is indeed the divine Son and the one who is sent, the Messiah. You know, this is a very interesting scene. It's the only time in the Bible that there is a physical manifestation of the Trinity. The Father is present because you hear the voice. The Son is present because Jesus is there in the flesh. And the Holy Spirit is present in the form of a dove. This is also a strong example for those who reject the Trinity idea in the Bible. Uh, 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 Jews, of course, Muslims, Jehovah Witnesses, you know, they say, oh, no such thing as the Trinity. And I always bring them there and say, well, how do you explain this? Who's, who's this? What's this all about? And then, of course, the fourth thing was to fulfill prophecy. Again, Isaiah 11, verse one and two talks about the dove. Isaiah 42, verse one talks about the voice. The prophet said that the Messiah would have the Spirit on him and would be pleasing to, pleasing to God. So some information about that particular event. Next event, Jesus is tempted in the desert. How are we doing? Okay, we're doing good. Matthew 4, Mark 1, Luke 4. <clears throat> That's why they call them the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, because you know, they're synchronized. A lot of things that are in Matthew, Mark, Luke are not in John. A lot of things that are in John are not in Matthew, Mark, Luke. So Satan tempts Jesus while he is fasting in the desert. And this is also a tricky concept. You know, the word tempt can mean various things. It can mean to test or to examine. Um, uh, it can also mean to, uh, to seduce into something evil, to look at, to find something evil in you and to play on that evil and seduce you into giving in to your, into your evil uh, and sinful uh, desires. Uh, but it doesn't only mean that, it can also mean to test. You know, to tempt means to test, to take, to take this and hold it up to the light and look at the water. I'm testing the water. You know how you do in a, your, 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 your swimming pool or your hot tub or whatever? You test the water to see its quality and so on and so forth. Here the word means to test or examine. Since Jesus had no sin, the devil's test was to create sin in him in some way. Because there's no sin in him. So first of all, the tests were first of all to pride by asking him to do a miracle in order to prove his lordship. You know, making the stones. Go ahead, if you're, so, if you're the son of God, go ahead, prove it. And of course, 
our human tendency for us, because we're prideful, to, I'll show you. You want bread? Now I'll make so much bread, it'll be coming out of your ears. You know what I'm saying? He also tempts Jesus to idolatry by offering Him something in exchange for worship. All the kingdoms of the earth, if He would worship Him. And He tempts or tests Jesus uh, to presumptuousness by asking Him to test God, to throw Himself down from the tower to see if God will save Him. The Father had already given Jesus all of these things. I mean, He called Him the beloved Son, so there's no need to confirm who He is with a miracle. And the Father had already promised everything to His Son, Psalm chapter 2, verse 8. Satan was offering something that wasn't even his to give. And the Father had promised in the word, quoted by Satan, that he would care for the Son. No need to test God's word for accuracy. I mean, the Bible says, uh, pursue the kingdom of God. Seek the kingdom of God. And what will happen? Well, all these other things that you worry about will, added, will be added to you. Do I need to test God on that? Of course not. So all the things that Satan was trying to create in him, you know, the fact that Jesus answers with scripture means that he was always aware exactly of his relationship with the Father. You know, on Sunday night I was preaching that sermon about shepherds and, 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 and I was thinking about this passage and, and I said at one point, um, Satan is, uh, uh, his best trick on me is to seduce me into thinking that I'm not a sheep, I'm a lion, or I'm a tiger, or I'm a stallion, or I'm an eagle. He gets me to, to forget for a moment that what I really am is I'm just a sheep in need of a shepherd. And he fools me, and maybe fools you guys too by making you think you're something else other than what you really are. That, that God promised something else than He really did. And I think the big difference here is that Jesus knows exactly, knew exactly what God had promised Him. He was always aware of His relationship. So He couldn't be fooled, tricked, tested out of that reality. So after the event, the angels minister to the Lord. Next event, now we've got to move, we're falling behind. John's witness concerning Jesus. John's gospel provides a detailed summary of John's preaching and the reaction of the people, especially the leaders. Interesting that only John talks about this. The others don't mention it. John 1 uh, verse 15 shows that the Baptist was aware um, of and uh, preached that he was preparing the way for the Messiah. John testified about him and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. John knew what he was doing. Not all prophets knew what they were talking about in the Old Testament. They were saying things, but they didn't quite understand. You know, would you think Daniel understood about all the, the coming kingdoms and you know, he was saying that, he was explaining it, but he didn't quite understand all of the ramifications of the things that he talked about that were going to happen in 700 years. But John knew what he was talking about. He knew exactly what he was talking about. It also shows that he shared in the experience of the voice of the Father and the setting of the dove. This was the way that he knew that Jesus was indeed the one. He knew when that happened, that's the one. And he had an impact on the people because even the leaders were curious about who he was. As someone was saying before, you know, some thought he was the Christ or he was Elijah, he was Moses. People believed that the great prophet Moses would resurrect at the coming of the Messiah. So they thought, oh, maybe this is John the Baptist. So of course, John denies all of these things and responds that he is simply a voice sent to prepare the way. Next event, Jesus' first apostles. Again, John chapter one. John has introduced him and he also encourages his own disciples to follow after Jesus. Now, the Lord didn't select all of his apostles in one day. He just didn't walk around, okay, you, 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 not you, not you, you, you know, that's not how it worked. They came in twos and threes over a period of months. 
Some, like Peter, began to follow Jesus while still maintaining his fishing business. Do you think that, that Peter, it was the first time Peter ever saw Jesus when Jesus said, hey, you come with me, and he dropped his nets and followed him? Well, of course not. They came from the same town. As an adult, Jesus lived in Capernaum. Where do you think Peter lived? Well, he lived in Capernaum, fishing village. So they knew each other. He, he knew who this person was. He had heard him speak. But after a while, Jesus called him into full-time ministry, and then he left all to follow the Lord. Kinda, it's kind of like that in real life. I, all the, a lot of the men that I know who've gone into ministry did something else before they were something else. I don't know, whatever, an accountant, a lawyer, whatever. And, 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 and after a time, and they were busy in the church and they taught classes, and then all of a sudden you know, they said, you know, I, I'm getting so busy and I'm getting so much satisfaction out of this ministry, I, I, think, uh, you know, I think I have a calling. I ought to go into ministry. So in this event, Andrew calls his brother Simon to come and meet Jesus, the one who he believes is the Messiah. And it's during this first meeting that Jesus gives Simon a new name, Peter. Next event, more disciples in Galilee. Andrew and Peter were probably in the region to hear John preach, and that's when they met Jesus. Someone from back home. After their meeting, because remember, he starts, you know, he starts with them. After their meeting in, in the Jerusalem, Jesus returns up north to the area of Galilee around where He was born and where Peter and Andrew come from and have a, a business. And while He's there, John says that he finds Philip and in turn Philip finds Nathanael. Isn't that how it works? It's like that in the church. I mean, you, you've come to a church where most of you, you, you either were born into it or you you know, you've come a little later when there was already two, three hundred people, but if you've ever started a church, you know, Elise and I have had the experience of starting a church from scratch in our living room, and that's exactly how it works. The neighbor comes with his wife, and then all of a sudden his alcoholic brother decides maybe he needs saving, so he comes to the meeting, and it, you know, you're five, you're eight, and then, then, then uh, and two little kids, and uh, somebody's sister-in-law shows up, you know, and you're, that's how it works. So uh, at this point, their concept of what the Messiah is supposed to be is not fully developed, but Jesus through His miracles and teachings, especially His uh, resurrection, um, is going to open up their eyes, going to open up their hearts. Next event, the first miracle at Cana, John 2. It's interesting that John is the one filling in the details of this early part of Jesus' ministry since as the cousin, because John is the cousin of Jesus. Okay? His mother Salome was Mary's sister and was in Jesus' inner circle. The apostles don't emphasize their family relationship to Jesus. You have to hunt for them. They don't brag on it. If they refer to themselves, they refer to themselves as servants of Jesus or slaves of Jesus, but never, well, he's my brother-in-law or he's my cousin. You know, -uh. they, never, they never make that reference. You have to find that reference. So he had access to the early information within the family and was probably present at many of these early events. His family relationship to Jesus also explains why he was given the care of Mary and not Peter. Why didn't Jesus give Mary to Peter to, to take care of? He was the kind of you know, a leader. He gave him to John. So John describes a wedding feast taking place in Cana, which is the northern, uh, in the northern country. It's just west of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus was there with His family, including His disciples, a lot of whom were related to Jesus and were related to each other. It was a family thing. There is a question about Mary's attitude concerning what Jesus was to do to intervene when the wine ran out. So I'm thinking, well, he wasn't speaking nicely to his mom, but remember, he's a grown man, he's 30 years old. So she was confident that Jesus could do something and goes to him for help. And Jesus responds that his hour has not come in the sense that it's not time to be fully glorified. There was a pace here. 
And what he says to her is that the matter is not her concern, but his concern. If he does something, it'll be directed by the father, not the pleading of his mother. It's not you pleading with me that's going to make me do something. It's if the father directs me to do something that will move me to do something. And so we see Mary understand that he'll do something, for, um, but only because it's given by God and not her. So Jesus transforms water into wine and launches the miraculous portion of His ministry within the circle of His own family, His own friends, His disciples, and His region. First miracle there. If it was me, you know, I mean, I'd go straight down to Jerusalem on the Passover day you know, with the biggest crowds, you know, and okay, watch, everybody watch. You know, but that's obviously the Lord's not taking my advice these days. So. After the wedding feast, Jesus, Mary, his brothers, and his disciples return to Capernaum, which is the other side of the lake. And where do they go? They go back to Jesus' house. <laughs> where do you go after wedding? Well, you go back to your house. So John makes a distinction between Jesus' brothers and Jesus' disciples, because at this early time, his brothers are not his disciples. So this is the end of the first northern or Galilean ministry. In the next section we're going to see Jesus leave the north, head towards Jerusalem again for His first public ministry. So we got three minutes. Let's do a couple of lessons. Lesson number one. Lesson number one. Preach Jesus as the Lord. The first thing Jesus did was demonstrate who He was by the witness of the Holy Spirit and the Father. Today, the first thing we should establish in any Bible study, debate, or teaching is that Jesus is the divine Son of God. If this point is made, all the other points will flow from it. I mean, we, we, people always say, how come you people don't have music? You know, okay, or instruments. You know, okay, we, we can explain that. But let's not take the two hours, if we've only got two hours, for that. Let's, let's you know, answer that quickly and move back to the important stuff, that Jesus is the the Son of God. We'll get to that, those other matters. We'll answer those other questions, but those peripheral questions are not what builds faith. Number two, obedience is so important. The Bible is not for discussion, it's for obeying. We study, we teach it in order to produce obedience. Jesus in baptism and in the desert showed that His holiness was proven by His obedience to the Father. He made no eloquent speeches. Where are the eloquent speeches here? There are no eloquent speeches. God not only wants us to hear the good news, He wants us to obey it, and when we teach others, here's another idea, when we're teaching others, we should be teaching them to, that, that the important point of the Bible is that we ought to obey what it says. Not just, here's what it says, but that we ought to obey what it says. That's an important dynamic, sometimes missing in our teaching. We're afraid to tell people that, okay, you need to obey this, whatever it is. It's okay, I mean, they may, they'll say yes or they'll say no, but at least they know, you know there's a line in the sand there. And then finally, start at home. Jesus' first followers and disciples were family members, people from His hometown and region. Saving the world begins by saving yourself. Saving the world starts by saving your family, your neighbor, your children. You know, if, if, if you go through life and your children, you've managed to teach them the gospel and they're saved, you've done a good job. You've done a wonderful job. Effective evangelism is not about programs or projects. It's about people sharing with other people that are close to them. Very few of us get TV programs, worldwide audiences. You know, we, very few people have that opportunity. But most of us have a husband or a wife or a child or a cousin or a next door neighbor. That's, 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 that's our mission field right there. 